Hello, and thank you for joining us. Today, we will be speaking with James Kelman. James is a novelist, short story writer, playwright, essayist, and activist from Glasgow, Scotland. His works have won numerous awards, including the 1994 Booker Prize for the novel How Late It Was, How Late. He has been long involved in political activism, both in Scotland and internationally. He has also been a longtime friend of the Kurdish movement and has written a book entitled The Freedom to Think Kurdistan, published in 2019. James, thank you very much for joining us. Yep, okay. So first, I was, I was wondering if you could tell us a bit about your background, um, how you began writing and how you became involved politically. Well, background, uh, let me see. Really, I just began as a, a young writer, or you could say as a young artist. Um, I'd left school at 15, so I had no higher education. And because of that, although I was a great reader and so on, but because I had no higher education, I just assumed the right to, to be a writer. So, or to write stories, put it that way. I assumed the right to write stories. Now, the difficulty there immediately facing me when I began was to do with the, the language in which I worked. Because the language that I use is a, what you might say an ordinary working class. Uh, an, the language of an ordinary working class guy who has a, an ordinary interest in politics, philosophy, art, and so on. In other words, it's a, it's a very uh, wide ranging thing. It doesn't, uh, so it, it usually suggests some kind of a tight uh, area of experience, but that's not the case. That's just kind of one of the many aspects of the propaganda we face daily. So, so I started writing when I would be about 21, started writing stories at that, at that age. Uh, now, the stories I wrote were generally about other 21 year olds, you know, or that kind of milieu, or usually, usually kind of old guys that uh, I found interesting and usually made me smile and told good stories. So these were the old guys that, when they were ordinary, Usually just ordinary guys are the ordinary guys that I met. Because uh, I'd had quite a, even by the age of 21, I'd quite a wide experience of life in a sense. Uh, you know, I started working in a factory at the age of 15 and became an apprentice compositor in a printing trade. So I'd learned how to, all about books and so on, or a deal about how you put them together. But when I was 17, we emigrated to the States, my family. So I ended up in California when I was 17. And although I'd been working for two years, uh, in California, the working age was 18. So I couldn't uh, work. I, uh, I never quite accepted that. We were in LA uh, or in Pasadena, which is just outside of LA. So I used to spend my time walking into LA uh, literally, because I would save the bus fare, I had no money, which allowed me to buy cigarettes, you know. So I would walk from Pasadena to LA, which used to be about 11 miles, I don't know where it is now, it probably isn't a road, it's all motorways. But I spent my, my time walking around looking for work, because I assumed that there must have been work for, uh, there would be a, a so-called black economy, that you, without having your social security card and so on. I assumed that, but I never found it. Uh, I didn't do the state exam. There was a state exam for compositors in California. And uh, I took that one and passed it. So I had a job, if I could have held out until I was 18, I had a job to go to work uh, in a, a printer as a compositor. So it didn't work out though for my father and his job. It's a kind of typical immigrant story that goes wrong. So I have four brothers. So what happened was basically my father and mother had to put enough money together to get us home to Scotland. But we had to leave one, one of my brothers, my elder brother, 
I'm second oldest, he was the eldest, but he had a job and he, he had enough money to survive. So uh, he was lucky enough to stay. That was what I felt at the time. I had to come home and kind of help out the family and finances. A very typical immigrant experience, really. So by the time I, when I came home, I could no longer work as a compositor. Uh, I was be approaching my 18th birthday. So I began a series of jobs in various places, but there was nowhere to stay really. I used to kind of dot between my grandmother's and my parents and sleep. <laughs> and so eventually I went down south to work in, in England, in Manchester and in London and so on. So by the time I started writing, I'd <laughs> a lot more experience, I suppose, than most young guys are 21. But it was essentially a working class experience and, and where that becomes important is in your use of language. Mm. So the example I've given often was, was what was expected of you. Uh, if I was to write a story about four, four guys just having an ordinary night out or going gambling and playing snooker or you know, going to die, uh, up to a dance hall or something for a few beers. Then I had to utterly alter my language and use standard English, the, the, like the King's English or the Queen's English. Mm -hmm. I had to use a standard literary form that absolutely destroyed the breath of life. They destroyed it. So, but because I didn't have a higher education, I was not really aware of that. I was used to reading. I didn't really read English literature because I, I, it was so hierarchical and elitist. Mm -hmm. And whenever I saw somebody from my area, then they were always being treated as though they were subhuman. So it didn't interest me. We were always servants, really. And we had no interior life. So there was never any thought process going on in working class people. It was always written in a kind of sociological or behaviourist form. So we all kind of walked about and spoke when spoken to, and we didn't move until the middle class person perceived us, and then we could kind of walk around, you know. So in a sense, we were born into colonisation, really. You know, so... Uh, and event, I just actually tried to kind of invent a language that, uh, I suppose, phonetically based, used in some of what I was reading. Uh, in a way, that wasn't enough either because my own reading had kind of expanded greatly. I was really, I was reading Russian writers and uh, I was reading Russian, German, French, some American. Uh, these, that would be my reading. So I was be reading uh, uh, people like Camus. As I've said elsewhere, reading people like Camus and Kafka and uh, the, the great Russians, Dostoevsky, and uh, it was too young for Tolstoy, I think, at that age. Mm. I would be reading Dostoevsky uh, and, and uh, Gogol uh, and very much Kafka and Babiel. And, uh, so that was the level I was at in my reading. So I didn't just want to, to write about kind of servants, you know, <laughs> and also wanted to explore uh, the inner psychology of people as, I mean, if you're reading Camus, you can't then go out and write uh, some sort of third party objective voice, you know, uh, and uh, in a sense, the same applies to, well, Dostoevsky, how, how did you write notes from underground in this kind of a uh, standard form? It just becomes a kind of contradiction in terms. Mm -hmm. Now, the difficulty there is, as a young writer, as any kind of writer, a young writer because you don't expect it. As a young artist, you begin by doing your best. That's what mm. you do. But what you find is when you do your best, you get punished. Mm. You know, so the first thing that happened to me with the very first story is that the editor loved it in a small student's magazine and tried to publish it, but the printer refused. Mm. They said, we won't publish this. That's like <laughs> various things. So, in a sense, that happened when I was 25, I think. I would have been 25 at the, the point, by the time. Uh, so, and from there, there on, essentially, it's remained the same. Right. 
there has been no change, really. In fact, now it's the, the case where my work's not been published in England for 10 years. <laughs> and, now, and now I've moved out of Scotland again, although I still live in Glasgow. My future work's all going to be published in America again. Mm. So, so, but one of the things that this does, it makes you, it's not because you have a politically uh, active kind of way of being. The politics is forced on you, yeah. rather than like identity. Yeah. You know, uh, and the kind of point that people like uh, Jean Genet or someone would talk about, you, you, you become a thief because people all respond to you or, or call you a thief. Mm -hmm. And in this way, like uh, in my, for myself, that's the way it was that, uh, I mean, by the time I was being kind of slandered with the Booker Prize and called an illiterate, I was thinking, hang on a second, this is my fifth novel. And I've, <laughs> and I've been published for 20 years. Why, why is it that they can pretend this is my first novel and it's like, uh, anyway, yeah. so what you find is consistently uh, these attacks in one way or another, mm -hmm. and gradually you form an idea about why this should be the case, and eventually you realise that your language itself is a threat. Mm -hmm. it's that, in that sense, it's the existence of people who, you, who it's, it's, it's the indigenous people, really. Mm -hmm. So the voice, in that sense, the voice of working class people, Mm -hmm. is the voice of the indigenous people, mm -hmm. the people essentially who have been colonized. Mm -hmm. That really is what amounts to. And once you get to a more sophisticated level as a writer looking at what you do and what other writers do and what other writers don't do, you start to kind of uh, analyze aspects of what it is not to assimilate. Mm -hmm. So if you decide I'm not going to assimilate, you know, you can, I, I'll give you a good example to do with being Kurdish. Mm -hmm. when, I went, when I went to Istanbul in 1997, I'd been through the co Turkish constitution. I, want, I wanted to see what I was walking into. I knew enough to know, uh, I knew that the Kurdish language or, or the most common Kurdish languages uh, it was against the law to use them. Now that included Turkey, obviously, but it also included Iran uh, uh, earlier on, uh, and uh, you know Iraq and Syria. These things people would be punished. The thing that struck in my mind was you were not allowed to sing songs, mm. Kurdish songs. You were not allowed to call your children by Kurdish names. Mm. So. If you, as a writer, even wanted to explore your own community, it was against the law to do it. Mm -hmm. The Kurdish example is a good example in that sense because it's a crime. It was, it was at that time in 1997, a crime. Mm -hmm. Now, an interesting thing, when I had read the, the, the Turkish constitution, I realized that I could actually break the law in Turkey by arriving with three particular books. I didn't want to take a lot of books to Istanbul. Uh, I'm quite a coward. I was wary of being kind of caught by the cops or something, you know. So, so I thought, ah, I'll do this in a very subtle way. Uh, I was reading Xenophon's expedition to Iran, to Persia. Right. So I thought, and, and in this edition, it uses the, 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 the refer to the, the name Kurdistan. And I actually call it, say, Kurdistan, right? Yeah. So I thought, oh, this is against the law. I'm going to beat the banishment, I'll just carry that book. I'll take Xenophon. And I'll be saying, who is this? And I'll be able to say, well, he was a pupil of Socrates. And, uh, <laughs> and I'll go into it. So that was really it. And the other thing I thought we'd do would be, I would take a map, an old map, hmm. in which Kurdistan appears. It's not like, as we know, Kurdistan or any, Kurd nowadays would say, oh, Kurdistan is, you know, even if you were talking in contemporary terms and you were taken from the Mediterranean and you, you go right, I always think uh, the, the map of Kurdistan, in a sense, reminds me of a horse's head, the way it mm. goes. It goes Mediterranean and down and then the, the Euphrates, Iraq, then up to Armenia, Azerbaijan. 
-hmm. So it really it has this particular shape. But in the old day, uh, say post uh, First World War, 1916 type of map, mm -hmm. you don't get Kurdistan like that. Kurdistan is referred, you'll see it, but essentially it's Mesopotamia, although it goes much further north. Yeah. So I thought, if I take on those three things, no, the third book was a great Scottish poet, uh, Sorley MacLean in Gaelic. So his mm -hmm. poetry is in Gaelic mm -hmm. because the authoritarian right, the far right lawyers uh, who write and control the Turkish state, see, the usual bastards control it, the lawyers, man. The lawyers in the army. Mm -hmm. What else do you expect? Absolutely. Now, the lawyers hadn't yet discovered a way in which they could kind of distinguish Kurdish. They had to kind of do a blanket thing for all kind of uh, dialects or something to say it was a crime. So the way they had written the constitution, they hadn't yet done a subclause. So if you walked in with a, a you know, a book of a uh, written in Gaelic, mm -hmm. the, the language of the Celts uh, or this particular branch of the Celts, it was a crime in Turkey. Mm -hmm. Plus it was, it was the map. The book because was it was not the official language of the British state. Yeah. 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 And, and it was also Xenophon. So these were the three books I took mm -hmm. with me to Istanbul, you know. <laughs> and anyway, uh, it's an interesting thing in that sense because once people understand what's going on about, it's actually a crime to do this. Mm -hmm. It's a crime to work in your own language. But once you realize that other things become clear, now, for example, the British state, the British state don't have a constitution. It means it's even more, in some ways, it's uh, potentially good for people who want to maybe attack the state, but it doesn't take you very far. It's really very much in the state's interest that there's no constitution. Mm. Uh, and once you realize that, and we know that, for example, the BBC, which uh, I would refer to really as the, the, the cultural wing of the British state, yeah. you know, in the sense that the, the army is the military wing of the British state. Mm -hmm. These are the way, once we kind of think in these terms, it gives us more of an insight. But the BBC in that sense, the way that uh, they would uh, not take anyone's work with a voice, a so-called accent. Mm -hmm. And even to this day, it's, it's actually worse now than it was when I was working mm -hmm. in the 1970s, 1980s. There's been a, quite a, a big reaction really, politically as well as uh, culturally. Mm -hmm. But now, uh, we're back to a situation where people are ridiculed with a, say, a, a, what they would regard, regard as a, a working class English voice. They only appear as servants or subjects of humour, ridicule and contempt. That's what happens. Uh, you know, that's the difficulty of being uh, English working class. Scottish working class, we, we have a, a kind of... Uh, an escape route through identity or nationalist identity. Yeah. Uh, but here it's a, it's a very interesting thing again in terms of colonization. I mean, Kurdish people would say, which Kurdish language are you talking about? Are you talking, you know, uh, is it the most popular? Which you will, uh, uh, could... Kurmanji, yeah. Yeah, Kurmanji. Yeah, I'm actually. Uh, anyway. And if you are okay, and the same applies to talking about Scottish, say, or Scottish working class voice. Mm -hmm. Because again, break, once you start to do some analysis at that uh, more sophisticated level, it takes you into other territory and it gives you more of a, again, more of an understanding of what's going on. As uh, my grandmother was a Gaelic speaker. Mm -hmm. So they, they were from the Outer Hebrides, that branch of my, my family. So they're from Lewis. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the Celtic side in my, my family is, is pretty normal in that sense. It's uh, maybe about 10 or 11 clans that, that I could, can wear tartan. And if I go to the other side, but where it becomes interesting is going to the other side of the, um, the paternal side, Kelman. Mm. Kelman becomes, it's a, that becomes quite a, an old sort of, uh, very quickly you see her into the, the Pictish, the, the Pea Gale, 
or the pea kelp rather than the Q, you know, Scots Irish is Q, Q, uh, Q Gaelic. But if you're on the other side, the older the Pictish forms, maybe it goes into uh, Brittany, Breton, and so on. Mm -hmm. Now, that's the Ab around Aberdeenshire. Mm -hmm. See, for example, uh, you, you find out that in my side of it, or, or the Kelman side of it, it's up around uh, a place called Akabrach. It's where the Roman em Empire basically stopped. Mm. They couldn't go any further. They were faced with all these people with blue paint and fucking knives, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so Hadrian, being a very wise Roman emperor, says, oh man, that's enough. Mm. So they stuck there. A wee town called Rainey, South Aberdeenshire. Mm. Uh, it's a whiskey trail nowadays. It's up here, all the good whiskey trails. Yeah. Yeah. So, so there's a place there, uh, there's like 5,000 year old settlements there. Mm. That's where the Kelmans are. There's a place here called Kelman Hill. Mm. <laughs> right. So, in what, and what you see if you read right, Scottish writers, uh, younger writers, even Welsh, Duncan McLean, and people from the East Coast, who are good on voice, then what you'll find is that it's a, it's a pretty different kind of working class voice from the voice you need from uh, people like myself and other Scottish writers from the West Coast. Mm. Because you're, you're having these different areas of, of uh, linguistic influence. Mm -hmm. Another one you'll get strongly from a branch of my West Coast family is a Viking, mm -hmm. uh, either, either be Black Viking, Danish or White Viking, kind of Norwegian, Scandinavian. Mm -hmm. You know, these are the two areas of uh, the McLeod, for example, is one of my uh, McLeod's my cousin, but McLeod is, uh, that's very quickly, uh, that's Viking, you know, that's uh, 11th mm. century Viking, or maybe even 10th century Viking, mm. when the first kind of, the horror started to happen, you know. Mm. So what you get there are these different areas of, uh, of peoples or the movements of people. And, you know, so you have a very old, 5,000 year old more. Uh, and then you have these other strains of Scots Irish, and you have the Viking, and you also have some of the, the Wasp, White Anglo Saxon Protestant Brigade. They're all coming in from the south, you know. Mm -hmm. So you have these different uh, areas of influence on what, what comes out, you know, plus you have that there. Uh, anyway, so there are these great areas that should be studied. These areas should be studied. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was a story, a rather an essay I wrote, uh, and I was looking at the language of uh, Gaelic on the page, and also the work of Amos Chuchola, the Nigerian writer, mm -hmm. and seeing how some of the way he uses language in English is shared between people who write in English or do translations from the Gaelic. Mm -hmm. Some of the use, use of the verb and so on. These things that are very kind of, that should be interesting scholars. Mm -hmm. They should be areas of study. They're not, because it's too political. Mm. It starts to question authority. It starts to question the, the right of one authority to be in a place yeah. and to keep indigenous people enthralled to them. Yeah. Uh, in, our, in our case, say for example, in terms of uh, what happened to the Celts, I, I would, and to our kind of a, what you call the Gaeltach or the, the Gaels or Gaeldom, the, the Gaelic speakers, Scots Irish. But what happened to us from the, in the Hebrides was basically the early 17th century. It was King James. Mm -hmm. It was the foundation of the UK. It was yeah. when the kingdoms of England, Scotland, and Wales came together. Mm -hmm. Ireland came later. Yeah. And at that point, King James was very explicit. They wanted to exterminate the, the, those who would not assimilate. Mm. They wanted to either exterminate or, or, or send somewhere. Mm -hmm. So that's why they planted Ulster, mm -hmm. the plantation from the, the borders to get, uh, you know, and they also planted, at the same time, they planted Lewis, the Scottish Hebrides, and, and quite soon after that, Nova Scotia. 
-hmm. and they wanted to send a plantation or to plant rather uh, to colonize effectively mm -hmm. uh, and what so the, these kind of uh, struggles then uh, with us that they're, they're kind of 17th century what they did at that point but very early 17th century 1603 was when uh, the uk was formed uh, two years later the enslaved the, the miner the mining community most people have no idea, you know, you talk about that and people have no, that was that was about the first thing King James did, mm. was enslave the mining community. And they stayed slaves until something like 1790s. Nearly 200 years, the mining communities were enslaved. Forgot radical history, mm -hmm. you know, none, none of that is taught. But, so that period at that point was, was a, a a process of the unification mm -hmm. of Great Britain and Ireland. At that time, King James, he referred to it as Britain, right. Great Britain, that's what he called it personally. So that, in a sense, was the formation of the British, the British state mm -hmm. from 1603. Mm -hmm. And what we see going on just now uh, is really an extension of that. And once we understand what, what happened here, it gives us more of an understanding also into Turkization or the unity that goes on from Turkey. Yeah, absolutely. This need for unity or need to uh, assimilate or else we will force you. Well, I think if you don't assimilate, we will force you yeah. or else we'll kill you. Absolutely. Or else go. Yeah. So what you're getting is rather like what's happened in uh, Rojava. Uh, uh, and Afrin. Now, the, what's been happening uh, to the Kurdish people in the, these places is basically what we would have expected in any process of imperialism. Mm -hmm. they're, they're colonizing, they're using their planting, they're, they're putting in a plantation, mm -hmm. they're putting in Arabs and very, and people really to take over the land, they put, uh, you know, that's actually what, well, we're used to that. Mm -hmm. We, we should actually be aware that this this is what what is happening. All of these things are. I mean, what what is very interesting too. You might uh, this is a quick jump though. Mm -hmm. Once you start to look at would be maybe the the relationship between. It's a theological relationship to the state, mm -hmm. the relationship between various religions, because you'll see that uh, usually. The authoritarian right, when it, but in this, an authoritarian state, it really wants to make use of uh, anything that's a threat, and usually they'll see the church as a threat mm -hmm. in some way or another, or not the church necessarily, because it may, it may be the mosque. They just they'll see they'll see a they'll see a religion as a threat mm -hmm. because the authority there is God. So yeah. how do we control God? That's a difficult one for the state, but the state tries it in different ways. Mm -hmm. It was very, it was very easy to do it in the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. All that King James did was he, he organized a team of translators and they translated the Bible. Mm -hmm. So the Bible used by all the Protestants to this day, you probably wouldn't, I mean, people, <laughs> the Bible just now is in the copyright of the British Crown. Did you know that? No. I didn't know that. The crown owns the word of God. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's crown copyright. The King James version. Right. The King's, King James led team of translators. He didn't do it himself. Sure. He employed a lot of working class writers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they translated the word of God. Mm -hmm. And he copyrighted the Bible. Mm -hmm. So what you see there is how, and of course, King James wanted to become uh, he wanted uh, absolutism, you know, he wanted to, uh, I mean, the crown nowadays are the monarchy's constitution in this country. No other countries it's not. Uh, but because of that, in theory, the crown is simply uh, the symbol of the British state, that's all it is. So, I mean, the royal family is a, a form of kind of Christmas decoration that was on the state, you know, 
but not all the royal family understand that. Some of them don't realise that they're actually uh, they're not supposed to exercise the rights of human being. They're a, they're a role, you know, uh, in the way that like a president's a role. Presidents usually start off doing the same. They want abs forms of absolutism. Mm -hmm. They want the hereditary principle to uh, to uh, be thrust upon themselves. So someone like Erdogan or Donald Trump, they they behind the scenes are trying to get the presidency as a hereditary right for their family. Mm. It's very much, <laughs> mm -hmm. it's all very kind of uh, uh, logical. Once you get the kind of, you, you work out what is going on, it's all to do with these forms of imperialism, control, authority, and so on. Mm -hmm. That's always what it's about, mm -hmm. you know. I think the I think the this connects to the point you made before about the similarities and how the Turkish state is approaching the Kurdish situation both within Turkish state as it exists and in Rojava and Iraq that it's uh, a form of practice that is learned from other places. This idea yeah. of a unified nation with a singular language and so on was learned from France, from Britain, from Germany. Yeah. Yeah. I mean. There are, there are things that people have should understand. It's one of the, re the reasons why history is important also is because it gives you a hold on certain arguments as uh, by people who have been in the same position as you. Mm -hmm. In terms of language, this is the liberation struggle has always concerned itself with language. Now, for example, India, in, Indian, uh, Indian National uh, Council, the, the old, uh, they, they're even something like a, uh, 1900, they they wanted uh, textbooks in local languages mm -hmm. to get rid of English. They wanted it only so people could do things like change an electrical plug. How can they do that if it's, if it's the language of, of the colonizer mm -hmm. and the imperial for you know? How can we talk to one another? Mm -hmm. We have to use the language of the oppressor. Mm -hmm. We want to talk together. How can we do it? You know. Uh, the, these issues, the language issues, are very important issue in that sense. Think about what happened in Iran. What we had in Iran was uh, we had something that might have moved towards forms of socialism and so on with Mossadegh. Mm -hmm. uh, now, when 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 did the CIA do them in? Would be about 1954, 55. 50, 53 was the coup, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So what happened then, and they put one of their puppets, Shah of Iran, they gave him the job, turned him into a multi-billionaire and gave him a lot of resources and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but that was, again, so he's an American kind of dangling up and down like most, most people around, you know. So anyway, what you had was like what as, as happened in Ireland, you had the church became very powerful because it was the voice of the people. Mm -hmm not because of anything particularly great about a church or a mosque or a religion. Yeah. I have to confess I'm a, a devout atheist. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, uh, religion was a powerful thing simply because it drew people together in opposition to an authoritarian regime. Uh, and that was Iran. So when Khomeini came in 1979 or whatever it was, mm -hmm. uh, the church was seen as a, a bastion of freedom as it happens in some other cultures, the American South, the church is a bastion of freedom against kind of uh, wasp society or something like that, you know, of the authoritarian uh, state up north, you know. But that happens in, in other cultures. It happened also. Look at old Atatürk. You know, Atatürk was quite right to uh, dump them all, you know, Dump religion, you know. If you see Atatürk on religion, he's really good, you know. Mm. It's got to know their place. Mm. Uh, but recently, of course, because the more Atatürk goes to becoming an authoritarian, uh, or his regime in Turkey during that period uh, in the 1920s, the more it becomes a real hardline authoritarian uh, regime, really, uh, mm. or state. And the more at that point, there will be more. Uh, people will be turning to religion because there's a freedom within religion. They will get a freedom of some kind of form of truth. You know, there, there are these things I think that's basically straightforward about how how people may end up going to religion and so on. But 
later on that will that will become something that's uncontrollable by the state mm. because it insists on the authority of God mm-hmm. or at God. It insists of some sort of form that cannot be controlled. Uh, if, so that has to become used quite subtly by states and states essentially fascists like Turkey, they will find ways to try and manipulate religion, you know, or Saudi Arabia mm-hmm. or Israel. These sorts of states that are kind of hardline, right-wing authoritarian, they, they will find ways. I mean, you know, uh, and those two with forms of Christianity that like where, hier- where hierarchy is very important. Mm-hmm. You know, so what you get is a transformation of a religion into something that becomes like the religious wing of the state. Mm-hmm. And if it's fortunate enough to be like maybe England, then they can actually get it where it's all kind of officers or like uh, not, not only the Anglican church, but the Roman Catholic church. Mm. Uh, or, or, and these things, these things you can see are, are also similar to things that have happened in aspects of other religions too, including Islam, mm. where, you have, you, you, where you, have, you have something where there's kind of lines of succession you know, where, where the, the, the person always, or the role of the person will take you back to the voice of authority, which is God, mm-hmm. unimpeachable authority, the voice of truth. Mm-hmm. So this is why this, the state always wants to try, how can we find a way to get an unimpeachable truth as ours, you know? And as you sort of uh, indicated before, historically there, uh, there, it emerges as an attempt to find the unity there with the divine right of kings and so on to assume the divine, the position of divine authority in the state or in the top of the state. And then yeah. sort of through the so-called modernization period, there becomes that rift yeah. conflict, but it tries to keep that absolutist form. Absolutely. Yeah, you, yeah I'm just thinking, you see it in India. So where do you have where you have uh, the, uh, the power of uh, fundamentalist beliefs in India and also in Pakistan and places around, you'll see conflict because of the the force, the 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 the, the difference in the actual religion itself, you know, uh, or, or the theology or aspects of the theology. You see how how open all of these locations are intellectually to manipulation by the authoritarian right because what they will do is find a way to make use of it because of that in that sense religion religions also a way that people who lack education make sense of the world mm-hmm. is like how do we make sense of the world you know or to make sense of things that people that are basically inexplicable yeah, uh, without a kind of far-ranging knowledge of physics or mathematics or logic or so on, or the sophistication of our linguistic, like the way I'm talking, uh, uh, you know, takes you to, questions, the meaning of life and so on. Yeah. Well, it takes it also takes you into the need that the the, the state has to manipulate mystery. Mm. They have the key to the mystery. They will unlock the mystery. Mm-hmm. So what you have, that's like two areas of knowledge, takes you into the idea of two areas of knowledge, uh, takes you into very old philosophical things, takes you into Pythagoras and so on. Mm-hmm. But we have two areas of philosophy, uh, rather two areas of thought. One would be the mystery of, of the intellect of ruling authority and the ruling elite. The ruling elite of areas of knowledge in this kind of box, mm. the lower order people, they have knowledge there. Mm-hmm. These two are in, in the days of uh, pre-Socratic or Pythagoras, it was called the Akusmata. There's like areas of knowledge. It's usually, you get it in all religions too. It's areas of knowledge and experience that's passed on basically orally. Mm. In song, uh, in song, in dance, Mm-hmm. You know, uh, I'll, I'll resist naming different religions in a sense because it appears as though you're 
Uh, but in, in various religions, you have these areas of knowledge being passed on to people that are effectively illiterate. Mm. But they're, they're, they're really worthwhile areas and they're good areas of knowledge. You get that in most religions. Um, it's very interesting because I'm a, as a story writer, mm. uh, you'll find a lot of writers are very interested in, in this, mm. you know, because there's great stories. And, yeah, it's a storytelling uh, tradition. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you a good example would be, a, uh, I would think would be in the Yiddish tradition. But just say the great uh, Hebraic philosopher, uh, existentialist, uh, uh, Buber, uh, mm. uh, Martin Buber, Martin Buber's wonderful work, uh, which is that which stories based on oral tradition. We have that in the Gaelic tradition too. It's, it's really it's marvelous stuff. So you're arriving at, and you get it in all, you get this in all cultures. You're arriving at areas of knowledge that are passed on from generation to generation. Mm. You get this very much in Kurdish tradition. Mm -hmm. But the, the ruling, ruling authority, ruling elite, they have their own areas of knowledge. And usually it's in written form, mm. you know, it becomes in written form. And, and they, they control power. That area of knowledge controls power. Mm. In most societies, they try and train what you might call cadres of of young people within their class to carry on the struggle for the on behalf of their class. Mm -hmm. So for example in the UK it's you know Eton, Westminster, Stowe, Oxford, Cambridge, Gordonstone, there are these select schools that the ruling class children always go to. And they have a form of education that is different. It is different from ordinary, the ordinary lower orders. They have a different type of education. Uh, that happens also in USA. Mm -hmm. If you if you're involved in the universities set up there, that the what they have the Ivy League system, mm -hmm. uh, different different universities, uh, but usually they have the same ethos. And they have the same kind of uh, uh, hierarchical structure or hierarchical assumptions of right in terms of it. It doesn't matter where you teach in the States, if you teach in the university system, you will find they always kowtow to the in Oxford, Cambridge. It's a standard English literary forum, mm -hmm. is as fundamental in California as it is in Louisiana, mm -hmm. as it is in, uh, wherever it is in the States. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I was once in a university in California and people used to praise a professor because he refused to accept any prose written after something like uh, 1800. Right. And he was praised for it, you know. I mean, the kind of person who thought T.S. Eliot was a saint, you know. <laughs> I mean, uh, they're just absolutely extraordinary elitists. You can't believe that mm -hmm. anti-Semitic racists and so on, but, but they have they have they have such a controlling power. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, as, as they also have here and obviously in yeah. Oxford and Cambridge, you know. Well, this you know. this um this brings me to to a question I wanted to to ask you. You wrote um an essay. Uh, some time ago in 1988, I believe, uh, uh, entitled A Reading from Noam Chomsky and the Scottish Tradition in the Philosophy of Common Sense. Yeah, that's right. And, and so these, some of these issues, the, the relationship between some of the historical Scottish thinkers and Rousseau and these, and these different figures are, are something you touch on in this essay. And, and in that essay, um, you, you discuss a number of central themes in the history of philosophy, but, but one of them is the, the question of human nature. And, and at one point you write, the basic principle of humankind is freedom, which connects to this, yeah. this point you were talking about, about certain assumptions made that have to be proven in yeah. the American tradition. But I'm wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on this point and talk about um, what, in your view, is the relationship between philosophy, political struggle, and human freedom. It's a bit of a large there question. <laughs> Well, well, in a sense, uh, yeah, but in another way, no, because uh -huh. it really shouldn't be. 
We shouldn't have to prove we're human beings to other human beings. Mm -hmm. When that's going on, you know that they're trying to steal something from you. Mm -hmm. That's what's going on. Yeah. Really, that's the essence of imperialism. You go into someone else's country and say, hello, here we are now. Uh, what, what do you want to do? Do you want to go away or do you want to stay? If you stay, you're a servant. Mm. You go, what do you mean? I just, I'm going to my house. No, that's not a house. What do you mean? It's like, no, we call it something else. We call it, we call it the castle. So that is now the castle. Uh, ah, I mean, this essentially is what happened in my own, that branch of my family from the, in the Hebrides, you know, really. Uh, it's a, it's, a, it's a very, it's an interesting thing. In terms of Kurdish history, I'll come back to the, the question. In terms of Kurdish history, some of what happened, you could say, under the Ottoman Empire in the second half of the 19th century had already happened in Scotland about three to 300 years earlier, mm. in a sense. The movement, the movement from a clan, oblique tribe, you know, that, that shift there uh, from uh, society based on clans and tribes and so on, uh, and uh, the movement from that where the head the head ban or whatever was was transformed into a member of the ruling class of the incoming of the imperialist. So the the tribal lands or the clan lands suddenly become the property of the the property of the leader. And your leader is controlled by the imperialist. You know, so in essence, what you have there is the essence of imperialism. You know, you're going with 10 people and you don't have to kind of conquer 10 million people. You just have to con conquer 10 leaders of, the, of each of the million, which is, you know, this is maybe Roman history, you know, uh, but the English used it very, very well. We sort of many other places. Uh, so in a sense, uh, there you are, I've lost that, get that, that thread, that thread's gone. How did I get from there? Talking philosophy, well, that's not a surprise. The... <laughs> <laughs> it's about human freedom and struggle, yeah. Yeah, philosophy. you know, the, yeah, I mean, the, 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 there is, the, in, in a sense, the, I see it in some ways as quite a, I immediately want to go off into different trains, different trains of thought. Mm -hmm. uh, one, uh, and, and again, it's to do with how you see philosophy itself, or the nature, of, the nature of philosophy, or what is a strength in philosophy, for instance. And uh, one of one of the the things about it is is how it supplies you, in a sense, with a a skeleton key to unlock theoretical issues and problems. Mm -hmm. You become a fairly good analyst. Mm -hmm. you, it gives you the tools to analyze something. And this, in a sense, is, I mean, for example, th this is part of like, it takes you into why upper classes are usually given some kind of education or educative pro process that will hinge on uh, exploring issues that we might think are philosophical uh, as the basis of the basis of what a subject is rather than a subject itself. You know, so you're learning kind of infrastructures. And if you know enough infrastructures, you can apply it to different cases. Mm -hmm. You know, in a sense, that's the Scottish tradition. The generalist tradition in philosophy is, is, is like that. It provides a very great basis for analysis, you know. Uh, and in, in a way, this is, this is why for, uh, this aspect of Western philosophy is a very useful tool mm. because it provides you with a, uh, what could you say, uh, a dialectic, really. Uh, it, it, allow, it provides a framework to get from a, a very difficult question down to a, a kind of basic thing or a very wide ranging question that gradually pulls it all together like a logical system. Mm -hmm. or, or algebra, for instance, uh, and it takes you down and it ends in one kind of one thing, x equals y. Mm -hmm. Like reduce or, terms or, to a simpler expression. Uh, yeah. else it's, uh, in, in logic, it might be just a, a string sequence of, of like, uh, uh, 
the use of the 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 upside down V that yeah. signals an and, yeah. and and if it's going the other way, it signals an or. Conjunction, so, disjunction. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean that that's uh, without going into that, but that's part of what uh, philosophy, in a sense, enables you to do. Mm -hmm. uh, like mentioned earlier, for example, this this is philosophy in play is very useful at, at this level. It's a very useful tool, and this is why it's so important to the ruling ruling classes. Usually have elements that we associate with philosophy, because the training is to be able to argue in a, in a lot, a lot of different fronts. So it's like you're you're learning the a skeletal how to use a skeletal key, or to recognise a key that may be skeletal, and you can go and unlock various things. Mm -hmm. This is like the essence of how do you train the leadership. Mm -hmm. This is this is how you train the leadership. So mm -hmm. this is the education in Scotland to try to supply to every student, which is called a generalist tradition in philosophy. Mm -hmm. So and which was anti uh, Anglo American traditional specialism. Mm -hmm. You know, so the Scottish tradition was you had a lot of fourteen year old boys running around and impressing girls because they'd be saying, "What's your what evidence do you have that God exists?" You know, this is. So the Scottish tradition is beginning, it's like beginning from uh, extraordinary exciting first principles mm. and slowly but surely going to the boring stuff at the top rather than the other way around, mm -hmm. which is to begin with the boring stuff and try and escape. You know, the first thing you do as a student, I did at 15, was escape. Mm. Whereas the Scottish tradition might not allow you to, or you might not want to escape until you're 24. Mm -hmm. You know, once you like, get to the boring stuff at the end, yeah, yeah you, you want to face up to the really exciting stuff. Mm -hmm. This is what you know, uh, and you, that is a kept part of what the Scottish tradition is, you know. Uh, and a lot of outsiders would talk about that. Uh, William Morris, the, mm -hmm. uh, the anarchist, kind of, uh, uh, you know, the would, would talk about the difference between coming up to Scotland and seeing the education system here, and or rather having the type of meetings that would take place with the Scottish revolutionaries and radicals, it would be so entirely different from what took place in England. Yeah. It would be completely different, you know, uh, and and they would very quickly be talking about philosophical issues or, or different theoreticals or getting bogged down in uh, aspects of uh, theology or something, you know, mm -hmm. um, which is not always a value, but at the same time, it's it's, it can be quite exciting, but it's good for in terms of, a, of education. In philosophy, what, one of the things about, for example, I would say, I mentioned Xenophon earlier on, you know, like mm -hmm. who, who learned under Socrates, or rather it was, it was an interesting thing. You know, Xenophon's, he, he's faced by a struggle when the jet, after the, the campaign to uh, kill the king of Persia, you know, he's taking all these, Greek troops all the way down to uh, uh, what is now Iran. And he stopped away down at the south of the Euphrates in what we would call Saudi Arabia, southern Mesopotamia. And at this point, uh, people are kind of, uh, the, the generals are getting killed. So he eventually has to take these huge thousands and thousands of soldiers back to Greece. Yeah. You know, how do you get them back, you know? Well, what would you, if you were a betting man, which I am, would you put your money on somebody who had trained under Socrates <laughs> or someone who had gone to a military school? Mm -hmm. You know, the military, ideally you want both, mm. you know, because they've got mm. to, like, your old Xenophon's got to face up to the mountains of Kurdistan. They've got to go through southern Azerbaijan and Armenia to try and get to the Black Sea, you know. Mm. <laughs> So, but a lot of the struggles were were, were how to uh, how to kind of recognise an argument and find ways of, of taking on an argument. So, in a sense, in a sense, the the that great Socratic method that you kind of maybe get in philosophy has shown you how to uh, or how to, how to maybe formulate an argument. Or how to get from one line of an argument to another and to follow follow something through. Mm -hmm. uh, 
a philosopher like Hegel, that would become that becomes the dialectic, or you know. But ultimately, what is the dialectic? You might go well. It's certainly a sort of a, a you know, you can give a, maybe an algebra for for it's just a string sequences, and you just to go from there to there to there to there to there, and eventually you might get a mode. Uh, one way to move, you know, rather than another way. And, and always you're looking for what way ahead should we take? Mm. Well, let's, let's consider all the arguments, which mm. is what Socrates does. Uh, no, Socrates does, uh, has had such an impact in the world. That's what he did. But in a sense, uh, that, that's what a lot of, that's what Wittgenstein does. So with Wittgenstein, but that becomes a, of great use to both the right wing and the left wing mm -hmm. authority and for statehood it's really great mm -hmm. you know because you take human beings out of the equation mm -hmm. everything becomes like a it becomes like a one of Wittgenstein's truth tables mm -hmm. it just becomes uh once you input this it's like a computing language once you input this string you've got to do this and if you do this, you must do that. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter who you are, this is what you will do. You know, so it's a very good way the authoritarian or the fascism. Mm -hmm. fascism it's like a technical apparatus almost. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and when you do that, you understand the rules of engagement in a war and areas of command. You must take your orders. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what right or wrong you take it. This is your position mm -hmm. within this, this table, mm -hmm. you know. Which is what you do. Uh, so, in in a sense, uh, that that is that is the importance to me in a sense of of a philosophical training. Mm -hmm. uh, that that was the essence of the Scottish tradition and the common sense philosophical tradition, that generalist tradition. So the the way it tried to do it was to give you various subjects, a general approach to education. So in the process of learning each individual subject, you, you would be acquiring, like you might say, skeletal, a skeletal framework mm -hmm. in which to recognize an argument. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you study five, three subjects, you would, you would learn ways in which you could maybe have a go at tackling a fourth mm -hmm. because you've learned some kind of uh, skills of deduction or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then you start so, from first principles. You're gonna and yeah. build up. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that it becomes a a, a really useful skill. Mm. This is why usually uh, a leadership usually has that training. Leaderships, uh, someone like Shenafon, going back to that example, becomes a very useful general mm. because he can he can actually use all those uh, different areas of, of knowledge and experience coming from people and arrive at a decision. Mm -hmm. You know, at this point, we should uh, we should come down the mountain and we should go this way. And we should do this because I've listened to everyone talk. I will arrive at this judgment. So it's like the education for a leadership, mm -hmm. which is what it, which is, what it is, if you look back at the history of education in the UK, for example, since the mid 60s, you will see that the focus is to try is to be on specialism. Because these specialists really don't know what the hell they're doing, you know. Uh, that becomes their excuse for doing for having no politics, for example. Yeah. Oh, I don't know, I'm just a, a trained lawyer, you know, yeah. and you go, come on, you bastard, you're a fascist. <laughs> you know, that's what you're doing. You know, oh no, we don't. We, all we do is like show how this constitution should be tightened, mm -hmm. because you know, our, our our masters have said we should find a way to fill that area of freedom with a ton of concrete. So we're yeah. provided arguments. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it becomes I mean, like the 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 point, like from uh, Eichmann in 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 the trial in Jerusalem, the the yeah. SS officer when he says, you know, no, only this little sphere, the train getting from here to there, was my job. Anything else, I didn't ask questions. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, yeah. Uh, uh, so these these areas, are, uh, for me, that that's that side of philosophy is a very kind of a important uh, and area that should continue to be part of an education mm -hmm. system. You know. Uh, and it also obviously it makes uh, it gives young people a great kind of feeling of uh, 
excitement because these are the these areas uh, like does God exist? You know, you don't want to be in a society where someone will kill you for saying that or cut your head off. Mm -hmm. You know, you want people to be able to say, well, yes, you know, here is a, uh, uh, let, let's talk about it. You know, you, you want to be living in somewhere where it's it's okay to be, to raise a question, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, so that area of fundamentalism, which is, a, which can always be manipulated by, uh, any authority can man manipulate that. Mm -hmm. All you need to do is capture the head man or his family and say, I'll kill them mm -hmm. if you don't do that. You know, it's dead easy to. Be a yeah. dictator, you know. Yeah. Absolutely. Again, I answered your question. <laughs> well, and perhaps at least in some dimension, these are these are unanswerable questions anyway. So, it's already. Yeah. Well. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, I wanted to to uh, switch topics a little bit. Um, so so something that you've also uh, written about and discussed uh, extensively has been the notion and the issue of self determination both uh, internationally yeah. and in the context of Britain and Ireland? In, uh, the, during that, in the late 1980s, we, we had organized an event here where uh, with uh, Noam Chomsky and George Davy, the great Scottish philosopher, and many other people, a great Russian poet, Victor uh, Kravulin, and others came from the, the other parts of the world to take part. From England, we had uh, people involved with the uh, the rape racist struggles at a very high level, Ian MacDonald, the QC, Gus John, uh, uh, Roxy Harris, uh, and John LaRose. Uh, so we, we had a, a lot of, uh, it was a really important kind of event. And the issues there were to do with self-determination because we wanted to get away from the idea of borders and mm -hmm. countries, and, and it was not a nationalist issue. Mm -hmm. So to that extent, it had to, I mean, we would, you could say in a very basic way, well, why would I want to kind of uh, be in solidarity with someone who's the king, but he's Scottish? So I was supposed to kind of uh, identify with, with, I'll just say the landowner. Should I identify with a billionaire because uh, he's got the same religion as me or something? or? because he's, he's come from the same country. Yeah. This is just foolish, you know. Uh, it, it leads you into all the different types of questioning, such as when do countries begin? Mm -hmm. At what point do we take our history on board? At what point does a history become the history that is acceptable to authority? Mm. You know, uh, because most of these questions to do with the, the, the validity of a position that's based on a historical process always starts and ends at a certain time. Mm. Classical position would be uh, Israeli state. You know, I mean, you go, why should, why does that apply there and not apply here? Mm -hmm. What is the situation in Ireland? How does the situation in Ireland differ from the situation in Israel? Mm -hmm. Or, or, or it could be in Saudi Arabia, or it could, whatever, you know, whatever the, the borders are drawn. You know, yeah. you know, you use that 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 example that I, I used earlier on about a partition in India. Uh, that's a tremendous uh, example to use on that. How you how you kind of uh, well, just about how authority will always want to introduce borders in that sense. You know, mm -hmm. right. So that form of uh, nationalism for me is a joke. Mm -hmm. Why would I? Why would I feel solidarity with that? See, see, you know, the ruling class are obviously try and take care of that issue. Mm -hmm. So when the Queen was about to have Prince Charles, oh, send her up to Edinburgh quickly. So the, so the kid's Scottish, you know, and you plan, what was that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, oh. I think Marx, Marx makes the argument in, um, I think it's the, the 18th premiere uh, of uh, Bonaparte, Louis Bonaparte or whatever it is, um, that... Uh, nationalism and the idea of a national consciousness is a uh, tool that the, the bourgeoisie comes to use as they assume control in the modern nation state apparatus in order yeah. to um, articulate the ultimate illusion that this particular interest of the ruling elite is the general interest of the nation. That it's that's yeah. the, the, the tactic, as it were. Yeah, I mean, that, 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 I mean 
any kind of society it comes out of the clan or tribe system. I mean, for uh, in the, the Scot Scottish situation, it's very clear. You know, I mean, the, the British state immediately made the ruling class members of their, their own state, mm. and they took on everything. So they they became the land proprietors and so on. After that, it was easy for the British state to take it off them if they wanted to. They would serve their interests, whatever serve their interests they would do. If they wanted to have, a, you know, a recruit an army to go to India, Africa, Ceylon, uh, the Americas or wherever, then they could use the, the local, you know, the kind of thing that they were doing, in, especially in Rome, you know, like uh, 1800 years ago, these kind of lessons of imperialism, uh, it's fairly predictable what happens, but they never, they never really, it's that area of interest that seldom filters its way down into ordinary politics, you know. Mm. So in the 1990 uh, event in Glasgow, we tried to kind of uh, organise a, a kind of, what could you say, an authentic form of self-determination mm. to things that would recognise distinctive cultures. So language was important, again, because the, the language is always an important issue in Scotland. And it's been for, it's never not been an important issue here. At one time, it was, Gaelic was criminalised by the British state, you know, for a, for a lengthy period of time. So these are historically part of issues that concern us. It was also a point in Russia, for example, when the wall, the wall was coming down. Mm. And, uh, you know, in fact, it had just come down about the month before we had the event. Uh, so these areas were these areas were being explored in various cultures throughout throughout the world. You know, the whole area about imperialism, post imperialism, uh, or post and post colonization. So in these areas were very important. Were being explored, mm. but being explored from a position that you might go Oshil and 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 PKK and people in Kurdistan uh, have taken from uh, some of the. Uh, libertarian socialist and anarchist tradition, mm -hmm. uh, Murray Butch, uh, Butchkin and, and others that, uh, who are within this area tradition, intellectual tradition, is very, you know, the kind of thing that has, has a ve had very positive uh, effects in, uh, in Rocheva and Africa and so on. Really, really powerful. Well, all, all states hate them. If there is a naivety in the Kurdish peace movement, it's because people who are trying to support these elements are failing to recognize what goes on in their own country. And think, imagine we try to bring in what we're supporting in Rojava here in the UK. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a directorate to the state, yeah. Or in, or in Sweden, mm -hmm. or in, in Northern Scandinavia, mm -hmm. where various linguistic cultures are fighting for survival. Mm. We are actually trying to get the state to support something here that, that is anathema to them. Mm -hmm. So they, these are these are really kind of uh, seriously important issues, you might say, in terms of uh, uh, the Kurdish struggle just now, and, and areas in which uh, it's interesting because what's going on maybe or has been going on in Kurdistan or in this area. Uh, of Kurdish culture mm -hmm. presents quite a nice kind of way of looking at other other parts of the world. Really, you know, I'm not hesitating saying something like using it as a paradigm. I, I really think it's a mistake uh, to get into using academic language that ultimately it sometimes goes up in a puff of smoke and nobody knows what the hell they're talking about apart from a bunch of scholars, you know. So uh, th things have to be broken down into language. And to use in concepts that people can kind of get to grips with, you know, mm -hmm. rather than just you know. So, listen, these 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 areas for me are are, are really important areas to be discussing. Mm -hmm. uh, not, you know, as again, I'm, I've left that train of thought there, which I wouldn't mind getting back to actually. <laughs> uh, anyway, well, well. No doubt. If we could, if if we could pick it up, actually, if you don't mind, um, I'm wondering then, coming carrying on from this, um, the centrality of this issue, and and the fact that, uh, 
as you said, these kind of approaches uh, of the like that is being experimented with in, in Kurdistan or various um, libertarian socialists yeah. so on. Um, yeah, I can tell you about your corner. I was thinking mm -hmm. people, uh, it will probably run into another uh, question from you as sure. uh, we were having that type of issue that was being discussed around that event in 1990 when Noam Chomsky was here and, and others. Uh, there were many people picked up on it, but including uh, 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 Iraqi Kurds, hmm. uh, a Kurdish community who were basically Iraqi, and they and were very interested also in what was going on. You know, so that was my first involvement with the. the the situation facing the Kurdish diaspora and Kurdish people, right. really, uh, and they invited me to to give a talk in Edinburgh University on on that area. Uh, so that became my first engagement with uh, the situation facing uh, Kurdish people, and there was a couple of good literary works published at that point. There was a great book published in. 1979, with uh, that gave me a, a very thorough background at the time in in terms of what was happening in the the four countries in uh, Turkey, Syria, Iraq, and Iran. So it gave me an idea of what was going on, mm -hmm. uh, and, and in general, in general ways, it allowed me also to note the difference between different Kurds or mm -hmm. Kurdish communities. So at that point, I could see, uh, or I, came, I, I soon came to learn, you might say, that never talk about the Kurdish movement as though there was just some unified struggle. Yeah. That it's very important to grasp that Kurds who are involved in Turkey will have a different, are, are involved in a different kind of set of arguments, let's say, than Kurds in Iran, Iraq, or in Syria, or those who are left up in Armenia. You know, there, there is very, it's different. So it leads you into kind of looking at various things and you start to see similarities and ways in which you can kind of work from your own position. And also understand for me, it was, it was good to see why people in the PKK, the Kurdish Workers' Party, were, were looking at Scotland. For instance, they found, people found Scotland of interest because of the, uh, self-determination issue. Mm -hmm. So there was already a, a, pra a pragmatic way of looking at it from people within the PKK, including Oshelin himself. Mm -hmm. So they, people were interested to know what, what does a devolved government mean? Yeah. How is it possible for this community, which is a Kurdish community, to live within a state that wants to kind of, uh, or, or rather, whose objective is unity. We, is it possible for us to find a way even to negotiate with the Turkish state that to recognize that we are a people, we're not asking for a country. We, we don't ask for that. We're asking for a way to exist. We want to survive. Firstly, we want to survive. Mm -hmm. This is not a theoretical position. We no longer want, want our people to be exterminated, you know. So it becomes a very pra practical and pragmatic thing. Yeah. This is, for me, has always been, I've found that always to be the position, except when it's been thrust into a position where people are fighting for, literally having to fight for survival, mm -hmm. then it shifts the position again. Uh, it's the position that happened when Germany took the Turkish line and decided, yes, let's make PKK a terrorist organization. Mm -hmm. That was unforgivable when Germany did that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I mean, there was, I, I was actually in Germany at one point speaking uh, with the Kurdish parliament in exile at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, around that period, I can't remember when precisely it was. Yeah, but early mid 90s, 93 or so. There was, no, it was later than that, but okay. it was some point. But it was, it was, it was just a, it's this shocking hypocrisy that, that gets you really. Mm -hmm. It's the hypocrisy of it and the cowardice. You know, I mean, the, the thing when you when you look at the Kurdish situation, 
what you come to see is the, the, the cowardice of states, the cowardice of Britain, the cowardice of France, the no. coward, the, you know, in, in the face of Saudi Arabia, Israel, Israel, no. Russia, and the US, you're faced by cowardice. Well, I mean, at the same time, I think it is, um, there is also, there is this element to it, but is, there's also a, a more active element to it in the sense that Germany, especially in Germany's case, there's this historical relationship with the Turkish state and the Ottoman yeah. Empire. And, and with, uh, with Britain, or with, with NATO, really, um, there has been, since the Cold War, you know, a, a, yeah. a long history of challenging any sort of, of, of any leftist movements or national yeah. struggles and so on as being terrorist yeah. in nature as being a challenge to the world order. Um, and so I think, I think there is this um, active interest involved as well. Active, could you repeat that? Is like an, uh, an active interest against the Kurdish, the, against the PKK yeah. and, and yeah. that aspect of the Kurdish movement, yeah. You know, yeah. And there, there is also, there is another kind of difficulty that is just is the way things have been. I was speaking earlier about how some issues that took place in, in our society, thinking of Scotland, of the Celtic people in the 17th century, you can look here at the uh, towards the end of the Ottoman Empire, and look at the situation in Kurdistan. So you you, you have also these these areas. Uh, it's, it's, it's too easy to say uh, you know the parallel. Well, well, we we could say parallel in a sense. So if you go to the second half of the 19th century and look at uh, the situation facing the different Kurdish peoples or different Kurdish communities. Mm -hmm. uh, some would talk about tribes and so on. You would go, well, the Barzani people, for example, in Iraq, you know, they're very distinctive kind of groupings of uh, people or clans, we would say in Scotland, you know. Mm -hmm. If you go to, uh, you know, the Mackenzie clan, the Macleods and the Campbells and all the major, you know, the major clans, uh, the McDonald's, the, the Lords of the Isles, and you have all these subsidiary clans, you know, you start to, uh, you get an idea then of that kind of setup that was going on in Kurdistan or wider Kurdistan, which mm -hmm. was happening in the, the second half, I, I think, of the 19th century. So that's very late. Mm -hmm. By the time the First World War begins and deals, a bit, uh, you know, when Kurdistan is with uh, Turkey and uh, before the end of the First World War, uh, before Ataturk decides to kind of uh, maybe pull things together and transform Turkey into a kind of uh, a, a, a kind of unified state at that point, mm -hmm. probably for survival. Uh, mm -hmm. but at that point, and gradually the Kurdish, because Kurd Kurdistan is already fractured at that point, it was never it was never a whole thing in the first place. Yeah. So these things are, are very difficult, you know. Uh, it's probably what's happening in, Kur in Kurdistan or the Kurdish wider Kurdistan is the idea that uh, it's, it's the attacks on us, it's pulling us together. Mm -hmm. how, do I, how do I know that I'm, I'm your brother? Because everybody's attacking the two of us. You know, uh, what the Kurdish people in Turkey in in, uh, during the 1970s, they all listened into Irani Radio Iran because there was a Kurdish voice. They could hear the Kurdish voice on the media, you know. So that kind of voice in itself is a unification of this wider culture. And that voice was heard on the Shahar and there was one Kurdish radio station. So the whole Kurdish diaspora that could get into that would listen. So how do we know we're all Kurdish? Well, we're all listening to that same bloody radio, man. We're all, you know, uh, that's one thing. So it's because you're you're defending against uh, the the fascist or the, the bully or the abuser or the killer. You're you're in solidarity together, so you recognise your affinities in solidarity in that sense, mm -hmm. uh, uh, solidarity and uh, empathy to that extent. You know, so uh, that that would be difficult at that time, and because also there was a, the caliph and so on, it wasn't like a you know, the, so 
people were still under the kind of uh, the infrastructure of the Ottoman Empire. There were, there were no, there were still it wasn't the idea that here is some kind of political solution. I mean, Ataturk and some people were going to bring, a, a, you know, like religion should know its place. Mm -hmm. It's the freedom of the people here we're talking about. We don't want to have another boss class here. We, we don't want another set of rulers here who are wearing some kind of religious outfit, you know, and telling us that they have the voice of God, you know. Mm -hmm. Come on, we've just left that. We, we're just we mm -hmm. fight to rid of that, you know. So that, in a sense, was difficult. I would think for for Kurdistan ever to mm -hmm. organize. What? Mm -hmm. What do you mean organize? I think when when I mean? when Ataturk, when Kemal first comes to yeah. to power in the new Turkish nation state after the the formal dissolution of the Ottoman Empire and the creation of modern Turkey, um, there's this you know, very seismic transformation in Turkish society and the arrangement of the Turkish state. Um, and I think the, the source of the first, the early conflicts um, in the 1920s between the Kurds and the Turkish state are, are on a religious basis in this way. It's because they, they made uh, Islam no longer the official religion and so on, that there was this, this tension and this conflict, you know. I think I think in a sense religion becomes a unifying feature, can. and religion becomes religion becomes again, and which makes it again back to, easy to manipulate uh, through it. You know, you suddenly you you have this kind of religious solidarity that be coming from from all over the world. These people are, are with you on this struggle, and mm -hmm. uh, because you you share share these beliefs, and it's you know. Uh, in a, in, a, in a sense, that's a, another kind of program or another uh, talk in a way because you get involved in that too much and it can take away from uh, other other areas. The area I'm, I'm thinking about in a sense is, uh, well, is that the, the, these ideas just now about uh, the, what do you say, confederalism or democratic, but in a way, the weakness in some ways, you could call it about the weakness of modern, modern Kurdistan, or wider modern wider Kurdistan is its diversity, mm -hmm. and because it is only you, you know what are we talking about when we talk about Kurdistan? Really, I mean wider Kurdistan. Uh, it's difficult to you know it's difficult to kind of think of of an actual thing. We can, I can. People who have looked at it for a while can because. We've, we've, we've gradually come to to understand how it's operated, maybe, or, or something about mm -hmm. it, that a kind of unified landmass we could define or draw a pencil around, you know. But but in order to do that, we're bringing together all these different communities. We're, we're you know we're, we're having to say the thing that allowed us because we because we were identified as an enemy. Mm -hmm. All these different places identified us as an enemy, and this is why we are together. Mm -hmm. We are we are the enemy. Mm -hmm. So this is why we have to shake hands together and fight back. And this is why and and there is a point where you might say, "Is there a thing that draws us together?" And you and and gradually, uh, people, uh, Kurdish people, might go, "Okay, sounds yeah. Mm. I can see why why we are Kurds because uh, you know." And you could, at that point, quite a healthy debate amongst Kurdish people mm -hmm. from wider, wider areas of, of culture, yeah. uh, Kurdish culture, as happens with uh, any of the big kind of, <clears throat> you know, there are these huge big Celtic meetings maybe in France or in parts of Spain and Celts come from all over, you know, blah, blah, blah. And it's a very exciting thing. Mm -hmm. But to say it doesn't maybe go too far, you have to be wary about who you're making friends with. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, at the same time, you know, uh, you know, my enemy. Uh, let's see, I'm. We're all the victims of it. Anyway, there's something about that that draws you together, mm -hmm. and you start to see what as you have in common. Yeah. Now, these are the things that can can be brought together in terms of like, uh, uh, you know, confederalism, where these different areas they have the right to exist. 
No, you, if, you, if you break down to Russia a few years ago and you go, look, there's uh, Christians and there are Jews and there's Shia uh, Muslims and there's also Sunni Muslims mm -hmm. and there are, there are various peoples here and, and we all, we want to survive together. How do we do that? Oh, well, let's, well, let's form this parliament and send in a couple of representatives but make sure they're not kind of as soon as you talk about representative, it's dangerous. Yeah. You know? <clears throat> so Kurdish uh, tradition, uh, the nice thing with contemporary Russia, I just say the, the, the attack on genderism or the, the need to have male and female, uh, the joint thing together, which is, is very new politically, but maybe in older Kurdish culture, is, you know, that would not have been uh, something that was like a, a boat from the blue. In Western culture, yeah, perhaps it is and so on, but not in every culture. So, but these things where we start to draw and make a valid, every culture is a valid culture, every community is a valid community. Mm -hmm. uh, so in a sense, you're, that you're being defined. This is like, a, what, what this takes you into is, is, is you move from empathy because empathy is a first principle. It's a, it's a given why that exists mm. because we, we, we are all the same species. But you move from the, you, you, the next stage from that is solidarity. Mm -hmm. So at that point, you find that you're, you're having solidarity from these different areas who realize that you're in struggle, they're in struggle, and they will share it with you. So in this country, you have different areas, you know. Uh, this is why the state always tries to destroy solidarity. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they did that very clearly in the UK by destroying the picket picket line. Mm -hmm. uh, 19, in the late 1960s, destroyed picket lines, uh, or rather what they called flying pickets, which is mm -hmm. solidarity picket. Mm -hmm. So these things get, uh, that the state always finds ways to destroy those. But that is, but this, this becomes a very important thing for the Kurdish movement and others who are in support with them. Mm -hmm. they, ha they have to not be in bad faith. And they're in bad faith if they do not take on and understand the relationship of themselves to their own state and their own country. Mm -hmm. People in the UK, they, they have to be able to understand the situation of being a Turkish human being, being, being a Turk. Mm -hmm. You have to understand the levels of misinformation and disinformation and propaganda that go within the state. Mm -hmm. That happens with, and the people who are within a fascist state do not necessarily know what is going on. Mm -hmm. They don't necessarily understand what's going on. Sure. If you were to speak about understandings of what's going on, yeah. If you were to speak about, uh, you know, like. A UK or an American talking about, you know, we have a free country. They would just burst out laughing. It's just like a joke. Mm -hmm. You know, the, I mean, extraordinary hierarchy and elitism of Great Britain, for example. I mean, and 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 the increasing movement towards a police state that's happened since the late nineteen sixties in Britain. Mm -hmm. You know, which we might go and use Northern Ireland, but. The, the way in which the army has moved in and on top of the police here. Mm. Now, people here, in the, because the, the, the UK who will not have seen that, they will not have noticed it until something big happens, like the minor strike, mm -hmm. or like, like any like any big kind of clash, they will see that's when they will recognise, hang on, what kind of place are we living in just now? Yeah. You have to understand that uh, again, I use the example that in, when I was in Istanbul, that mainly with the human rights and people of higher education, you could say, uh, who, when I referred to, to Chomsky, they didn't know of his work as an, as an activist. They were saying, you mean a linguist? And wondered why I would be raising some of the issues he was raising. Mm -hmm. And what that what you learn from that is the levels of disinformation within a country and the control of information. Yeah. You, even without knowing, then you realise these books are all banned to you anyway. It never even occurred to me, you know. Mm. But, but 
these these are things that you have to international forums of solidarity I find difficult because most of them are stupid mm. when you get like international pen I just find sometimes what they say a joke <laughs> you know when you get I don't want to mention the name but one of the the, uh, the head people in international pen maybe making a plea to Erdogan to kind of think again or something I just blush yeah. There's something you go, how in the hell could you, jeez, oh man, I don't want to show my face. Yeah. This is just, or, or, you know, or if you try and go to like the, the Westminster Parliament, I represent that. And, uh, you know, and you expect maybe the House of Lords to listen to what you're talking about, about showing solidarity with the people of Rojava or something. Yeah. And, you know, you're a bunch of fucking anarchists, man. Well, you don't. <laughs> That's Murray, Murray Bookchin. You know, we're talking here. You yeah. were going back to Kropotkin. We were talking about why did Kropotkin fall out with Marx, you know. Uh, we're, we're, we're talking about issues at, 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 at a certain level. This is what people who, who, who read about these things are aware of. So when the Kurdish movement, for example, and people, well-intentioned people, want you to make a, a you know, petitions towards certain, it's like, how do you petition Adolf Hitler? I mean, give us a break, you know, it's just silly. What you have to do is to try and get to the people. Mm -hmm. The people who make the change are the people within the country. Mm -hmm. The people who are not represented by, or they are represented by a fascist state. Yeah. But it doesn't represent the wishes of the, the people within that state, yeah. because you don't know what the hell's going on. Mm -hmm. Like in this country, they don't know what the hell's happening. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, this this yeah. brings me to to another point I wanted to to ask on this on this question. Um, how you view then the prospects for self determination today, given the current state of things and the nature of the state, and particularly, or as an example, in in Scotland today. I think there's been there's been quite a reaction over the last years, and people should should not underestimate or should try and understand that that's what's happened. And I mean, you can see it uh, in in contemporary literature for even some of some of the struggles that were going on 20, 30 years ago have kind of uh, they've given that ground back to authority. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, people are no people are. Uh, are no longer kind of pe people are kind of assimilating more now. Uh, you know the, the the people involved that want to kind of deal with the Scottish Labour Party, Scottish Nationalist Party, and so on. It's just kind of it's, it's very it's, it, you, you, it's very hard to fight against the foolishness of these positions. Mm. It's very difficult to do it and to uh, you know like it's a kind of childish or naive kind of debate really that, that, that I mean the, 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 the still there is no debate to be honest about it there's nothing the kind of the Scottish Nationalist Party is what it is it's a nationalist party and it doesn't seem able to it's, it's, it's afraid to, to break out of that position they've made you know but, but there are people within it who are who are trying to who have taken on kind of that it's like an old kind of a Leninist position or something. Mm. Uh, they, they, they still kind of feel entryism as possible, you know. I mean, like the great, a great thing for people like myself was when the PKK gave up uh, uh, a Leninist position. Mm. You know, in a way, in a way, uh, I mean, Marxist Leninism, in a sense, I wouldn't say destroyed a great socialist movement, mm. but I mean it was almost like a, a CIA plot, <laughs> and and the existence of Comintern, uh, because it managed to destroy the validity of local community. Mm -hmm. The whole the whole kind of thing about what was coming from the nineteenth century was a struggle against authority, and it was a, yeah. and it was happening in all these different cultures. 
Yeah. yeah, and there are many examples that we could use, you know, whether we're talking Italy, Germany, uh, the former Yugoslavia, there are there are very there are many different and India towards yeah. the end. There are all these different examples we could use of people who were taking the best of their culture and moving forward within their own community and the, the dynamic dynamic nature uh, of their own culture, mm -hmm. you know. And and then from 1917, you know, from that period, uh, which had such a great effect in Turkey uh, and Kurdistan, apart from anything else, but uh, but throughout the world and every liberation movement was strangled by what happened then. Mm. I mean, I, I happened to like Lenin, you know, as a man, I like, uh, uh, he's one of these guys like, uh, I like, like Sun Yat-sen or someone that they're, they're there are good kind of uh, people involved in a tremendous struggle against the odds, but but things about what of how they moved very quickly were, were wrong. I mean, they they made they made uh, mistakes now that are still made. I regard them as elementary, mm -hmm. which is, is like failing to recognise that a distinctive people is a distinctive people. Yeah. You know, like they, if you say, well, I recognize the artist thing, you say, well, why does it not affect the way you look on how you you work with them? Mm -hmm. Why would you expect, like, uh, you know, you have somebody great, like Tito arriving 1920, like some of the great radicals from Scotland and, and others all over the world, they arrive in Moscow in 1920, and Lenin eventually tells them, forget about your national liberation movement now. Forget mm -hmm. about that. Childish. From now on, we're all working together. It was fall in uh, line under the Soviet Union. Yeah. Yeah. Communist International was a way ahead, and so many people within the left still believe this. And it's kind of, and here we are, 120 years later. It's just fucking shite. It's silly, you know. And it, it's always like, you know, as if it's been invented by the far right or something. <laughs> but, so in a sense, approach, yeah. in a sense, people have had to. And the great thing with PKK, in a sense, is that the they they have they have and again maybe to do with Kurdish culture is not being afraid to change because mm -hmm. in some ways it's, it's, it was not a modernist culture it, it, it was a it's moved from it's moved had to move so quickly between about 1870 and uh, 1925 or something or 1930 it really had to totally shift and change it's taken a long long while yeah. but always hope and. But the rest of the world doesn't stand still. So intellectually, all these other modes and modes of resistance, uh, modes of defense, and, and what uh, you know, uh, people can look at. Uh, I think Oshlin, when he was younger, my generation, I'm older than him. I'm, a, I'm about two years older than him. But our generation, a 60s generation, is looking at what's going on in Vietnam. We're looking at what's going on in South America. You're, we're looking at all these different ways in which uh, uh, imperialism is operating or attempting to operate. You know, mm -hmm. so the, these are these are things that with it's, it's taken a long time to come out, out, out of that. That was like 50 years on from the 60s is where we are now, which was 50, 40 years on from Lenin and, and so on, which led to Stalin and so on. But what it what ultimately arrives is the way it does happen in these in cultures is the people bring it to an end. Mm. It's the people themselves that will bring it to an end. So my in terms of uh, just say the Kurdish struggle like other struggles, there must always be arguments being put to the people. Mm -hmm. It's never enough to say go, don't go to the representatives of the people. They've already been corrupted. Because they're not the to, real representatives of the people. That's the point. Yeah, you have to get to the people. Yeah. They've been corrupted through the ordinary ways in which an empire is created. You just get the person who is leading, and you buy him out, or you do something, or you threaten to kill his family. Mm -hmm. What you do is control him, mm -hmm. and that is always what happens. You know. Absolutely. So you have to actually find a way of dealing with the people, getting to the people. Mm -hmm. So in Turkey, that means because the Turkish people there. Not just like any people. There's good, bad, and different. Those who are intellectually challenged and those who aren't. Those who are prepared to go and, uh, look at an argument and those who will not look at an argument. Mm -hmm. Those who are who are 
going to be trapped by theological uh, truths rather than philosophical or physical truths, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, so that you will get that in any society. So there must, there has to be ways in which we can kind of present the reality. This is this is what it is. There are ways we can do that. Mm -hmm. uh, often through, and it can, can be through individuals themselves, and how how individuals are seen. You know, uh, whether that is someone like Oshilin or Mandela, whether it's uh, Nehru or uh, you know, not so much Gramsci. I wouldn't say that thing, but but people who are that the people have got to know as leaders, and then they're taken from them. Mm -hmm. You know. Uh, these these are and and also when when it's uh, it's, it's, it's the things that will, will that people will look that will give or bring about empathy and solidarity. What mm. what will bring that? Mm. Things that are usually to do with the integrity of one human being. Mm -hmm. what, what makes people? What will make people go to Oshelin? Is is the integrity of the human being? It will, it will not be much of the, the arguments. It will be for some, for others, it, it will not necessarily be that. Yeah. Because you may see a writer who spends, like, like uh, Gramsci or like Nehru or like Mandela, people who lead liberation struggles who are in prison for, for periods of a long number of years mm -hmm. are also a prisoner of the learning they can do, of the education they can acquire. Mm. Mm. And they also they also are in desperate the, the absence of communication with other human beings. Yeah. So the thing that brings about a, 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 demo, a, a really democratic society is when the voices of all the individuals can be heard. Mm -hmm. Someone who's in prison for years is, that is removed from that. They're removed from all the, the the exciting work that's going on by other people, developments of arguments. No one person knows knows it all. Mm -hmm. Not the even Socrates knows it all. No. Not Plato didn't know it all. No. Not no uh, no philosopher knows it all. Sure. No no no. I must say no prophet knows it all. Mm -hmm. That will take you into a logical point. Mm -hmm. That takes you into a point that uh, developed from various good philosophical positions and gave gave rise to that the theorem by Gerdel. Hmm. Uh, no one can stand outside of the world in that sense and, hmm. and deal apart from God. Hmm. No one owns the voice of God. There is no religion that can nothing. So uh, if, you, if you have a, a great thousands and thousands of people singing songs and so on or speaking in voices or or praying or whatever it is they they, they will have as much a, a chance of a, a, any sort of communication as anyone else mm -hmm. it takes you into areas that kafka explored in the castle for instance mm -hmm. but they, these are the kind of, these are the, the areas that you're in with you but the the whole thing about the individual is to do with the integrity of the leader. Why, why, why do people still have such respect for someone like, like Chomsky or Wittgenstein or some of the great philosophers? It's not really uh, about uh, the great theories they put forward. One or two, maybe, but so often it's to do with the life they led. Mm -hmm. What kind of life did they lead? If that leader beat his servants up, then I'm not going to trust his philosophy. Yeah. You know, if, if that great artist is a racist, don't even bother showing me his art. It doesn't interest me. Mm -hmm. You know, so you're you're at you're at a thing where this is this is the first principle is it takes you back into these areas of humanity. It takes yeah. you into what 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 is the the way in which she marks altered for, for people in the post-war period as well, was going back to the humanism of Marx. They did that in the States, they did that here. Mm -hmm. And there's a, there's a very interesting thing with Marx in terms of Marx's alienation, for example. What is like, what is alienation? You make, 
alienation is when, when people are separated from what it is to be human. Mm. The other person who was exploring that at exactly the same time as Marx mm -hmm. was a Danish philosopher, Kierkegaard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Kierkegaard was all, and, and so the, both of these figures at the same time, I think Kierkegaard's about five years older than Marx or something, about the mm -hmm. same time that both of them arrive at this similar thing to do with the validity and, and the, the uniqueness of the individual, of that one individual. And one being. can say in, in his own way that these themes come up in Nietzsche as well, in the same period. Roughly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what you get from Kierkegaard is fear. Mm. He's scared of that. Marx isn't, he's one to say about the freedom so people can have the freedom, can move on from that. But Marx also read some of the, the Scottish common sense philosophical tradition. and was aware, aware of how some of that, these aspects were filtered through some of the German tradition. Yeah. Um, and, lead to, and, and lead to some of the great kind of uh, theologians, you know, take you back to people like Calvin or something like this, mm. or the great struggle between uh, uh, Luther, Calvin, and uh, Svengli, or the, you know, these three great issues to do with, uh, that takes you somewhere else, man, I shouldn't do that. Right. <laughs> these are, these are, these are, very, these are interesting areas. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Well, I, um, I'm sure I would very much like to. I'm sure this conversation could could be carried on much much further. But but I'm aware of of time. Um, yeah. I I wonder if if there's any final thoughts uh, you'd like to leave us with in closing. Well, it, it would just, it would just be, it would be good to see. For me, it would be good for. It's always good for people to look at each other's struggle. This, this to me is one of the most important thing it goes, things that go, goes on, you know. When, when the people in the Iraqi Kurds came, uh, they, had, they, they had asked me to go out and talk, it was, and which led me into seeing what was going on in the, the Kurdish liberation. So it was also to see it and understand why it is that uh, many people in Kurdish, a wider Kurdistan, see affinities with the, the, the struggle of Scottish Irish people and or, or in the self-determination movement in general, because they're facing the same issues. Let's learn about it. Or sometimes I get approached by people from different kind of language cultures uh, that are uh, in, in a state of oppression or being repressed in some way or another. Uh, because once you can actually share uh, knowledge of each other's struggles, it, it leads you to, to advance it leads you to kind of uh, save yourself time. You don't always have to fight the same the same struggle. You know, you don't have to always be fight. You know, uh, but so these areas of solidarity and to recognise empathy and take on the struggle that the states already moved ahead of, of, of that struggle mm -hmm. because they've been combating. They've actually taken a position against empathy. Mm. In, and it's actually a, a worked out position, you know, like uh, human resources, you know, the advent of human resources. Mm. Human resources, well, the, uh, you, do you know that the earlier discussions took place in Northern Ireland on human yeah, resources? No. Yeah, but part of what goes on in human resources is, or are, are, are part, part of why it's become, become so powerful mm -hmm. is because it's a way you can defeat the result of the Nuremberg trials is the way you can defeat human rights legislation. Right. If if you can separate how a country is run or how a nation is run from its kind of democratic positions, talking about democracy, right? Because most legislation is based in, on human rights, the rights of children, the rights of disabled people employment rights and so on and they're they're part of our legislation as you, you call, as an advancing civilization as an advanced country mm -hmm. so the station has been finding ways the far right have been finding ways to defeat that 
It's very difficult for them. They tried that in the war in Vietnam, the famous case, Lieutenant Cali. And mm. the, the far right, you know, in other words, Britain and France, Germany, America and everything, every state in that sense, every state in that sense is far right. Every state is authoritarian. That is, so they try to destroy uh, the, the, the effects of uh, or the consequences of the Nuremberg trials. Mm. They, they try to say that they are rank and so on. Ah, but he gave me the order to, to kill yeah. 550 men, women and children. I was to shoot babies. He said I was to shoot babies first. Mm. You know, uh, so I got the order. And, and basically that, that was their defence. I'm carrying out orders. So that was basically the, the argument of Lieutenant Carley. He didn't have anywhere else to go. So that was what was destroyed by the Nuremberg trials. Mm -hmm. So they, they don't give up on that. It's like, well, we're not going to win there. How do we do it now? Well, we have to find a way of ignoring it. How do we ignore it? We have to find a way of saying, of they can do it in capitalism. Capitalists already, they, they do that already. Uh, because the shareholders, it, they can't operate in any moral or ethical issue yeah. because the first duty is to the shareholders. So, you know, this is why they have to operate as fascists, you know. <laughs> uh, so human resources is a way in which uh, policy supersedes everything. It doesn't matter uh, what, how, a, how an individual country operates in terms of its own democratic ideals and so on. Mm -hmm. It gets superseded by policy, by human resources, not by the policy. Mm -hmm. You know, and they want to take you back to the situation the state is in, where no decision is a personal decision. Mm -hmm. Every decision is an inference. Mm -hmm. So, in that sense, Wittgenstein's uh, uh, proof in that sense, our, our truth table, that is how a state wants to operate. Mm -hmm. Everything is an inference. There is no decision for a human being here. Mm -hmm. There is a chain of command. Yeah. And that all, and all different different forms of knowledge, in particular the sciences, are, are one could yeah. say, weaponized uh, en route to realizing such a, a rigid deterministic kind of system, like the, the management sciences, you mentioned behaviorism, psychology, propaganda, have yeah. all, you know, there's a concerted effort there, absolutely. Yeah, it's, yeah, a, a theory is a, a, yeah, I suppose theory of state or something, but there we are. So again, it's, it's just that, this is why people, I mean, I, I'm sure people are so, have been so interested and excited by the Kurdish, the developments in Kurdistan or what could be there and why it's so dangerous and it's not simply dangerous to Turkey, Syria, Iran, or the Iraqi state. Yeah. It's because it's dangerous in terms of how the world operates. Absolutely. We only have to look at what goes on in countries like India, in, country, in countries where there is any caste system or where there's any you know, uh, hierarchies like in the UK. These, these things are, these are under threat mm -hmm. because, because of the uh, uh, people are recognizing is the value of that going on where these voices are equal voices. Mm -hmm. you know, when, when you're reading some of what's going on within, what's going, going on in Rochevar, you can see why they had to stop it mm -hmm. or do what they can to stop it. Yeah, yeah, it's you a threat know? to the whole order, absolutely. And, and why f people, free people really should be Moving, moving to support it, but no one. But it should be a clear-eyed struggle. It should be one that does not does not accept the propaganda. Mm -hmm. Like, unfortunately, too many Kurdish people thought other places were free. They mm -hmm. believed the propaganda. Mm -hmm. Oh, the people in Britain are free. <laughs> Pardon? Yeah. Oh, America's free. You know yeah. what are you talking about there? Yeah. You know. Which, you know, which culture in America are you talking about? Yeah, well, propaganda no. machines are very powerful, absolutely, in the world. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we, we, these areas are they're really, really uh, complex. Uh, mm -hmm. 
But, but, but what you find is that there are these areas where peoples, plural, are, are kind of adapting or looking to operate within these places. Mm -hmm. So it's not, it's not like a, a recipe to give up the ghost or be pessimistic. Sure. You know, because but, but it, it's also important to be to clarify issues as we go along, mm -hmm. you know, and not not fall back into I don't know uh, easy forms of whatever it is, whether it's Marxism, whether it's uh, theological positions or anything that cannot that there is no attempt to clarify. Mm -hmm. You know, you you really have to. It's always like. What is it you're talking about here? Mm -hmm. You know, and I think so, something very I, important to to combat that that dogmatic uh, risk is you, is a is a continuous yeah. sort of reflection and, and awareness and asking and seeking clarification adaptation. Yeah. yeah. So you're you're back to something that Kurd, Kurdish people in the wider Kurdistan would probably say yes, well, because you're talking maybe about Athenian democracies in a way, or you're talking about tribes. Or you're talking about people around a campfire, 30 people talking together about the way ahead. Yeah. You know, it's a, it's a sophisticated form of that. Mm -hmm. But that, but you know, but that that is that, that these are the ways ahead. That are otherwise, uh, you know, you, you're locked in. You're locked into these forms of, uh, you know, I'm resistant saying capitalism, but if you say imperialism. You know, uh, okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. A form of an answer. It's uh, on the way towards, we can say, an answer. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I really enjoyed speaking with you. It was a great pleasure. Thank you. Right, okay. All right.